Tonight's Journal Club uh, is about three of the most popular articles that we have had in the journal. Um, very, very exciting. Um, Andrew Wicklin and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, he came down to visit me to uh, supposedly learn something, and I think I learned more from him over the last few years. Um, he's, he produced three major articles for us, uh, 23 hour total knee in 10 opioid pills or less, 23 hour total hip in 3.5 opioid pills, and can a novel opioid protocol, opioid free protocol prevent opioid addiction? Uh, Andrew's not only about opioids, he's about all kinds of protocols. If I'm correct, all his patients do not get formal physical therapy at all. Um, in New York State, which I think is a pretty big state, Andrew is the by volume number one joint replacement surgeon in the state. Um, and uh, he is in the upstate region, uh, ranging from just outside Syracuse to Utica, to Genesee, to that whole swath of the upstate area, which is, which is really huge. And um, what I'd like to do first is, um, I think that's my last slide. So I'll stop my share. I'd ask Andrew to sort of really just, Andrew, if you can, give us a sense of um, why you went on this journey. And we're going to do this in sort of like a um, Simon Sinek kind of way. Why, how, and why? You know, why, why did you go on this journey of protocoling your hips in a certain, hips and knees in a certain way, especially around opioids? Well, uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who's attending. I really appreciate it. Um, and to Ira for uh, helping uh, mentor me uh, over the last uh, decade, really. Um, uh, make, make sure it's clear. Uh, I don't have any um, affiliation. Uh, I know that this is being sponsored. I'm not being paid for this talk. I'm not being... You know, I, I did ask Ira to send me a bottle of wine to do to, to this journal club, but... Yeah, that's right. He didn't do it. Um, uh, so I, I really look at things from a customer standpoint. Um, I'm from West Virginia. I've been told my whole life I'm uh, second best. And so I would go to the, you know, the Hip and Knee Society. And every year you go to the Hip and Knee Society meeting and you're looking for one or two pearls to bring back to your practice to, to, to make a change. And there's a point in your practice that you get to where you're, you're kind of doing everything that's being said and, and perhaps even ahead of that because it takes – takes years to to get this stuff published and so I went to a meeting uh, back in uh, 2017 and I'm hearing people talking about oh well, you know we're doing this in 60 pills and and uh, I'm like geez you know we're doing it in 30 or less I think and you know I, I said this to a number of uh, uh, other hip and knee society members and they said girl prove it and so I made the very costly mistake of saying okay I'll take you up on that which, you know, it's, a, it's been an expensive endeavor, but it really has also been an important endeavor. Um, you know, I don't know how many, how many surgeons are personally responsible for what they're prescribing, but I would guess at least one in 10 orthopedic surgeons are, are personally responsible for an opioid-related death. And, uh, you know, there's, I think there's 30,000 orthopedic surgeons. So, you know, that, that's, a, you know, I don't want to be the, that one. I have a colleague that that was, you know, he's really big about, uh, you know, keeping the opioids down. And um, he got a phone call from a, from a patient who said, you know, we really appreciate that you're doing this because actually, you know, you operated on our son a number of years ago and he got addicted to opioids and then he died. So, uh, you know, I think all of us need to take this seriously. And, um, you know, the, the research has been enlightening, you know, sometimes uh, I think all orthopedic surgeons, we all think we do better than, than we really do. And so when you look at your own data, the numbers aren't as robust as you'd like them to be. Uh, so as a consequence, uh, I went, uh, went ahead and, and tried to uh, look at how my personal patients are doing, listening to each of them as a customer, uh, not just from the opioids, but all the other things they complained about. And that's really what has changed my practice. And that coincided at the same time that, uh, that Craig and Ira were working on that SwiftPath program. 
And, and I didn't believe outpatient total knee was ever going to happen because I was given 120 opioids out myself. And uh, sure enough, uh, you know, they, they presented data that seemed very compelling. And so here I am, what, let's see, six years later, five years later, we started in May 8th, 2016, and I will never go back to that surgeon. So hopefully I can uh, uh, talk about a little bit why uh, the things that work and what doesn't work and hopefully answer people's questions. And uh, I'll do my best. I'm not an academic uh, person, so I'll do my best to quote literature as best as I can. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a, a, another introduction um, and, and some rules of the game. There are no rules. If you want to say something, you could unmute and talk or you could put something in the chat, or you can raise your hand, however you wish to do it, that you're comfortable with, we're good. I'd like to, well, we do have a sponsor tonight, and it's very nice to have industry sponsor these events. Um, Samantha Strain from Avanos, and I'm just gonna introduce her briefly, and she's gonna just explain uh, why, they, why they're here and why they're very supportive of this kind of work. Um, not just the journal and not just the opioids, but uh, in work related to innovation in orthopedics. Samantha? Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Kirschenbaum. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. Get on video too. Um, I have a quick presentation, just two minutes here to go through. So let me get that up and running. Everybody see it? No. Hold on. Oh, hold on a second. How about now? Yes. Perfect. All right, let me get that going. All righty. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining tonight. Thank you, Dr. Kirschenbaum, Dr. Wickline, um, for your support here. We're excited to be a part of today's discussion. Um, and to be partnering with this journal. So um, I wanted to just take two minutes here, give a brief overview of Avanos um, as a company, and then talk a little bit about our on cue pain, pain pump. So Avanos um, is a medical technology company focusing on delivering solutions that improve patients' quality of life. So here on the slide, you can see our full portfolio of products, um, starting with you know, our respiratory and digestive health um, products to our pain management solutions, which we'll be focusing more on today um, within this discussion. So within pain management, we have our interventional pain solutions as well as our acute pain solutions. Um, and really our focus for all of these, um, all of our products here are to improve patient outcomes and reduce opioid usage, which is you know, really what we're gonna be focusing on a lot today, what uh, Dr. Wickline has studied. Um, so, so that brings us to OnQ and the OnQ pain management system. And so what that is, that's a non-narcotic um, elastomeric pump that continuously delivers local anesthetic um, to a patient's surgical site or in close proximity to the nerves, which provides that targeted pain relief. Um, so our Selectifil pump is our flagship pump. Um, that's the one that Dr. Wickline uses within um, his multimodal approach. Um, for total knees and we used in the 23 hour um, TKA study. So what are the, the main benefits of the OnQ pump? So with OnQ, you know, you get as summarized on this slide here, you know, you have your significant reduction in the need for narcotics. Uh, you have customizable control by being able to turn on or off um, the block. And then you have that continuous pain relief for up to five days. And in addition, you know, we have numerous studies that have shown that on cue um, provide patients with the shorter length of stay, quicker discharge from the hospital, and, um, you know, their rapid functional recovery with earlier ambulation. And so finally, just looking at on cue versus other pain management solutions, um, you can see we have a proven solution that provides the long lasting pain control for your patient. So overall, that was just a brief overview. Um, I wanted to thank everyone again for joining tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion and um, I will turn it back to you, Dr. Kirschenbaum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good deal. So 
Andrew, we have uh, a bit of a why you did it. Um, anyone have any questions at all that you want to ask right now? I we want to leave it open. Um, Andrew and I could talk all night about this, um, but uh, any, anyone else's experience they'd like to share? If not, we, we can keep on going on. Just remember to unmute because we can't hear you if you don't unmute. You know? Hey, Andrew, Greg Brown. Um, I applaud you for everything you've done. It's, it's tremendous. Um, I, I find that a lot of this is, is all about patient expectation and if you talk to them ahead of time and tell them you can do this without narcotics, that, that they can. Same way if you tell them we're going to watch you overnight and you can go home tomorrow if you're comfortable, they're like, great, I want to go home tomorrow. And, and so um, is, is the magic in these protocols about expectation management? So you are, I think, you know, you're right on, right? So it's all about expectation. So one of the things that I, I try to remind my staff about is, you know, I've done over 20,000 joint replacements now, right? So between residency and in, in practice, you know, it's a huge number. And it's hard to, you know, when someone calls and says, geez, my, my knee's a little warm and red, it's very easy to say, yeah, that's normal. Yeah, and I, 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 don't, I don't need to hear that. And, but for the patient, that's their very first time. And so I think you have to step back as the surgeon and as the, the, the care team and remember that for each patient, that's their first or second time to have a joint replacement. And for them, you know, th these questions are not trivial. Uh, you know, unfortunately, my wife's going through some cancer treatment, and I, it's very interesting, to, you know, and, and scary to be on the other side of the fence. And, you know, joint replacement is no one looks forward to having a knee replacement. No one says, I can't wait to have my, my second knee replaced, you know. And so you have to really put yourself in, in the customer's shoes. What does the customer want? The customer wants to know what is normal, what to expect, how to, to make it easier for themselves. And they want to know that, that you are uh, the, the right person for the job. And so the managing the expectations starts six weeks. So the minute the patient says, I want a joint replacement, that's where you have to start managing the expectations and, and, and also optimizing the patient. So you have six weeks now to, to get the albumin right, to get the hemoglobin A1C right, uh, to get the, the thyroid uh, checked, to make sure that that's uh, appropriate. All these different little things that could make a difference. And at the same time, you need to be educating. So that's where, you know, uh, I was lucky enough to, to meet the Ira and Craig and they had this swift path book and, but they make each surgeon write their own book, which forces you to sit. I, I spent six months, nights and weekends, not, not hanging out with my family, writing this, the first book. I mean, it was painful. Uh, and looking at every little step that I did and asking myself, why am I doing this? Is it because Lester Borden told me to do it? Okay. Well, was there, was there good data behind it? Or was it just because he said it? And sometimes that's great, but other times it's helpful to have data. So, so I looked at every single step from six weeks pre-op uh, to uh, 12 weeks post-op. And I, I try to write it down in a book, every single step in that pathway. And so now I'm on my seventh version of that book and patients are shocked at how accurate it is and how, how I, I can tell them exactly when their depression is going to hit at between ten, you know, day 10 and day 17, somewhere there. And where that day between day seven and 10, 8% of patients will have increased calf pain because that's the maximum swelling. And now I have the data from Brian Lloyd's group, he's a doctor of physical therapy that we're working with, looking at post-op swelling to, to prove that. That's why, that's when the leg hits its maximum swelling, the entire leg hits its maximum swelling. And, but that was, just something I, I documented because patients would write down in their little book. So I really encourage you to uh, address the patient's fears. And, and then again, if you look at my, my papers, um, the one paper talks about, I believe it's in the knee paper, that you need to have multiple visits with your patient. Uh, there's that, that, that decision where the, you or the PA says, okay, I want to have surgery. Okay. So you have a discussion then and you give them that booklet that they need to read. And then you, in that booklet, there's uh, slides for them to do an online education class. And then they go see a physical therapist once preoperatively to show them how to use the equipment. And, and again, tell them what to expect. Uh, and then uh, you see them for the decision for surgery visit. So again, now the patient comes back to you educated somewhat 
And now you can go over things again. And I have videos, again, explaining what, what to expect over the next five days. Remembering, of course, that no patient can, can understand and comprehend the full 120-day spectrum. So you have to give it to them and then give it to them again in bite-sized segments uh, that, that are really coincident with the time frame that they're, they're seeing. So a long answer to your question, but I would say at least 25% of the opioid answer is education. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Andrew, how, how did you make the jump from, I am comfortable doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm Andrew Wickline, I'm in my practice. A lot of people are going to me. And now all of a sudden, you're just gonna change it around. Like what, what, what was that moment? like so again uh i'm from like west a virginia. courageous moment like, well, what was it no it's i'll be honest i got a chip on my shoulder i'm from west virginia everyone told me i'm second best my entire life and uh i was afraid that i've got competitors in the area so you, you know i'm typically in the top five in the state for volume and i have competitors directly in my area that are also in the top five and i like to race cars there's only one position that matters that's number one and I was afraid that I was going to get behind. And um, it's kind of been like my whole life, unfortunately, that I, I was afraid that someone's going to, that I'm not going to, you know, I'm just not going to do well enough. So I just decided that uh, you know, once I heard that, you know, I heard um, the guy from Chicago, what's his name? Uh, the the, the two incision hip guy, um, Richard uh, Berger. Oh, okay. you know, he came out and said, you know, and, uh, I did some two incision hips and sure enough, those patients did pretty well. But then the data came out saying that, you know, it was fracture risk and so forth. And so uh, I kind of backed away from it. Plus it was challenging. Some cases were easy, some were challenging. And so I started looking at anterior hip and you know, that all worked out. So when he came out and said, you can do outpatient total knee, I said, that seems absolutely insane to me because patients at 36 to 48 hours are in screaming in pain in the hospital. So there's no way that's going to happen. So I, I, I poo pooed him in 2014 and 2015 I'm sitting in AUKUS and Craig McAllister comes out and says, Nope, I'm doing outpatient total needs too. And I said, okay, well, there must be something to this. I better, I better change or else I'm going to be left behind. And so that's again, the, the kind of the rationale behind my thinking. Wow. Um, so you took that long to write that book, right? And it's then, and then you feel the patients get great value from that, right? Uh, I would say that the patients tell me that the number one thing they like about my program, and they love my staff, and you know they love outpatient and no opioids. The number one thing is the book. The book is their bible. I mean, it, it comes in with dog ears and, and like uh, you know little tabs on it and, and highlighted. When I see that, that's a patient that's going to succeed. It also tells you that patient's a little anxious but that's still a patient that's gonna succeed that perhaps in the old method, the old conventional way where I'm gonna send them to the therapist, they're gonna to be tortured three times a, a, a week. Uh, that's a patient that would not succeed because they don't have enough understanding what normal is. So yeah, I do think it's, again, just like what Greg Brown said, the education is the key. Now I, uh, you know, um, a lot of people, some people know me on this. I, I have both of my knees done by uh, my, a uh, very close friend, Craig McAllister out in Seattle, uh, primarily because, uh, you know, you can't find a good joint replacement surgeon in New York City. So I had to go, of course, all the way out to, all the way out to Seattle. I'm actually going to share my screen for a second. Uh, I, um, I wrote a blog a few years ago, knee replacement surgery on a knee replacement surgeon. And uh, it became the number one blog on Medscape. Uh, and it documented with video and everything else. Um, and then my first one was four years ago. And the reality was I had three, I was amazed because I, uh, you know, for, for us in the South Bronx, you know, 60 milligrams of oxycodone three times a day is a, is a starting point. Now, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but you know, it's, it's not what I had. And I had three opioid pills over the course of the whole treatment. And we have seen a number of surgeons make this jump. Uh, I'm not going to put her completely on a spot right now, but I'd be interested before the night ends what Erin thinks about what, um, 
what goes, what she thinks goes inside surgeons' heads to make a paradigm shift and how, how they do that. Because I think that's part of the story here is that we're seeing six years ago, 120 opioid pills plus physical therapy, plus skilled nursing facilities. But there's just, the list goes on and on and on of, you know, when, we, when I first trained, um, you know, we, we, we did have scalpels. And um, when I first trained, we had 14 days in the hospital. First seven days, they weren't allowed to get out of bed. So, and I'd like to say that's not ancient history. So something, something re re really clicks. I mean, so if anyone has anyone else to say, I, I, you know, please say something now if you'd like. I have some more questions for Andrew about the articles and, uh, and, so, and some things about that. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'll keep on going then. Um, this is actually, I, I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, in uh, 2014, I moved from Minnesota to the Pacific Northwest. Okay. And so I got to start over. I didn't have any patients that I'd done their knees before. And this is how you did it last time. Why are you doing it differently? And, and, and things like that. The other thing that uh, uh, made me efficient was, is I didn't have a PA or a nurse practitioner. And I was at two different hospitals doing all my own rounding, all my own orders, all my own discharge summaries. And I'm like, I, I really don't want to see these patients in the hospital three days every time they have, just because that's what everybody's doing. And, and so what I told my patients said, I'm not going to, I'm, I never, I've never kicked anybody out of the hospital, but I will bet tomorrow morning, you're going to be fine and want to get out of here. And 75% of my patients without any, anything other than essentially that wanted to go home the next day. They wanted to know that their pain was managed, not that it was zero, but that it was managed. They saw the physical therapist the next morning. They felt that they could do what they needed to, to get home. And like I said, 75% of them said, yeah, I want to go home. And so the other thing I did is I quickly shifted my rounding from eight in the morning to get it done and be gone to noon so that the therapist had seen everybody. So my, my transition was, was somewhat artificial and that I, I moved. And so I could change practice and I started with the clean slate and I could do whatever I wanted. But just like I said, telling patients, you can go home, you've, the therapist seen you, your pain's managed, and here's what we're going to do. The other thing that I think is missing in, in all these conversations is nobody links pain management with venous thromboembolism prophylaxis protocol uh, uh, protocols. And, and the reason I think that's so important is if you use anything but aspirin, it's really hard to use NSAIDs. You can, you know, you, I, I do Celebrex occasionally because I don't think it has an antiplatelet effect, but it's really hard to do NSAIDs and be opioid free if you're using anything other than aspirin for VTE prophylaxis. So um, I actually curious about comments on that too. Of, you know, everybody talks about pain management, but nobody talks about the interactions with low molecular weight heparin or river roxaban or warfarin or any of those other issues. Greg, I, I will tell you that um, I do think it's in one of the two papers, the hip and the knee paper, but I totally agree. Um, every patient that uh, is on Eliquis or Xeralto because uh, you know, of AFib and so forth, what I do with those patients, they all take half a dose for five days and then they, they resume their regular dose. That's not based on any paper or anything. That's just what I've done for the last... I don't know, decade. And um, because I, I agree with you, you're going to create increased bleeding, particularly in the knee. And there's no nowhere for that bleeding to go. And so it sits in that capsule and it becomes like a, a, a local um, uh, compartment syndrome almost. You know, I've had three knee arthroscopies. The first time I behaved, it was easy, not very painful. The second time I thought, well, I can get away with this uh, like more. So I went to a party. I had hair then. I, went to, I got a haircut. And then I went to Tractor Supply. I got some, bought some fencing. The next day, my knee uh, was extraordinarily painful, very swollen. I couldn't put any weight on it at all. I mean, I, I was almost in tears. It was so painful. 
my now ex-wife would not bring me to my office so I could fix it. So I drove myself down, stuck a needle in my knee, I took out 100 cc's of blood. All of a sudden, my pain was remarkably better. And so I, I personally had experience with what, what a total knee has or an ACL has, right, at 36 to 48 hours, a big, giant, swollen knee. And now I saw how painful it was. And so, you know, adding eloquence to that fire, that, that I agree, or, or Zeralto. Again, I'm not picking on any of those medications, but I, I definitely think there's it was it was definitely a difference. I mean, look at, look at uh, I think it's Jay Parvizi's work, um, but I'm not certain. You know, there's lower infection risk when you use aspirin. Why is that? Because there's less bleeding. There's less bleeding in the leg. And I do agree with you that there's going to be less narcotic use and less pain because you're using something that doesn't create uh, the same trauma, the same swelling to the tissue. I'm going to ask you a question, Andrew. I, I, I remember watching uh, a big New York Giant fan. And uh, I remember uh, Justin Tuck said to Eli Manning, you know, how'd you throw that pass, you know, to Manningham in a Super Bowl? He says, you know, I just... I just threw it where, uh, where he was going to be. And Tuck said, it can't be that easy. It can't. So I'm going to challenge you a little bit and say, it can't just be the book and the education. You know, what are, what are some, in the last five or six years, what are some of the techniques, tools, drugs, innovations, products, industry products, and anything that have added to this? You sure. know? I'll kind of try, I'll do my best to run down the list. And again, the back of the total knee and the total hip paper, I've listed out what I think are the appropriate steps. And, and again, so that, that's a way for, for anyone on this call, just start adding one piece at a time. You don't have to do it all at once. You add one piece at a time and you'll start finding the difference. But I will tell you, uh, I went to a meeting, again, I went to the Hip and Knee Society and I saw Craig McAllister's speech about, oh, look at these numbers, it's amazing. So I, I begged him to come to his his Swift Path first Swift Path meeting. In, uh, I think it was the December fourth. It was down at a. I parked my car in a hotel in New Jersey, in a restaurant in New Jersey. I thought I was going to get. Yeah, stolen. we went to the Hackensack Mortons. Yeah. Yeah. I thought my car was going to get stolen that night, uh, and and I go in to see this magic that he's doing, and and you're doing, and the magic was oh it's a book, and I thought oh my god I just drove four hours and my car is going to be stolen for a book i already have a book the hospital gives a book to all my patients i'm going to tell you that book is absolutely worthless it's crap it is absolutely i mean my book now compared to six versions ago that that's six the very first version is crap compared to what i do now i'm telling you that you cannot rely on the hospital book that 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 collates the posterior hip surgeon the direct lateral surgeon the anterior surgeon with a surgeon who uses cuminin the surgeon who uses eloquis and the surgeon that says you have precautions and the surgeon that says that you're 50 percent weight bearing the patient looks at that and says i don't this is not me I, none of these rules really apply to me and so that book is worthless they don't look at it so you have to create a book and you have to make the patient bring it to every single visit and you have to have them read it and be involved in it once they see that if they don't bring it to the visit, I cancel the visit. You don't bring it to the hospital, your, your surgery is canceled. Now, admittedly, I don't cancel the surgery, but I tell them I'm going to. And so they, they, they get the point that you've got to read the book and be a part of it. And, and I'm telling you, those patients, they, they really, they do amazingly well. And so I would say number one is the book. Uh, number two is you really, again, think about what the, you have to listen to what the patients are telling you. In my office, patients would tell me, you know, I would see the patient in three months. Uh, it would take him three months to be happy with the, the standard conventional U.S. Uh, technique of going to therapy and so forth. They would come back in three months finally happy. I'd say, oh, Dr. Wickland, I like my new knee now. Thank you so much. It was a long road, but I like my new knee. And uh, this other one's holding me back, but I don't want to do it. Why not? You like your new knee. Dr. Wickland, that was miserable. I don't ever want to do therapy again. They tortured me. They made me cry. So, so if you listen to what the patient's telling you, the patient's telling you, they're your customer. They're telling you the soup is bad. Fix the soup. And so that's how I developed this therapy-free technique, which is really, you can see a therapist, but the key is no exercising, no strengthening the first six weeks. I want every surgeon on this call to think about the few times your patient has fallen at three weeks post-op and split their knee open, and you had to go back and wash it out and sew it back up. What is the tissue like? You are taking suture, and you're trying to sew jello to jello. 
Think about taking a piece of jello, cut it out, and put a suture through it. It doesn't hold. And that's exactly the time the therapist is starting to say, well, you've got 90 degrees now. Let's start strengthening. Let's do some sit to stands without using your arms on that 57-year-old patient with a BMI of 39. And so we, we presented at the World Orthoplastic Conference an 8% uh, post-op therapy complication rate. And so think about it. Again, if, you're, if you break your ankle or sprain your ankle, are, are you walking five miles and doing lunges and squats the next day? No. So, of course, it's going to make it hurt and swell more. We all know that. But yet, if you look at the way that the, we're reimbursed for total uh, knees for therapy postoperatively, the first uh, reimbursement is for 150 feet, a flight of stairs, uh, independent with ADLs, dressing yourself, going to the bathroom. So every single patient can do that day of surgery now. So the next time they show up in the, the therapy office, if you're going by the guidelines, as we saw, at least the way I understand it, you have to start strengthening and conditioning to get paid. Now, this, the savvy therapists write what they need to to make the government happy, but don't torture the patient with strengthening and conditioning. So that's really, again, that was the next, cab, the next thing that I think sets me apart from, you know, the Mayo Clinic 50 pills, you know, Anderson 2020, the Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute, total hip needs 45 pills, total knee needs 60 pills. That's 75% of patients need 60 pills. You know, you look at... Uh, uh, December JAOS 2020, Australian perspective, you know, three weeks still using 56% still using opioids. We're at 91% no opioids at three weeks with this protocol. You know, uh, um, you know, another study, you know, 62% for uh, uh, still using pills at one year after uh, total, total knee, you know, if you look at the registries. It's, it's because we're not looking at what the patient's going through. It's because we don't get paid for anything beyond that next 90 days from the time of surgery. So, so, so you, got, you, got, you got those two, right? You got the physical therapy light or physical therapy appropriate. Um, how about techniques? Minimally invasive, hip, anterior hip made a difference for you. What do you think? So, you know, from a multimodal standpoint, there's plenty of studies showing that multimodal versus opioid alone better. But, you know, again, uh, Austin's group at 2021 JOA with the multimodal, you need 60 pills for total knee. Opioid uh, only group needed 90 pills. So, again, there's that 50, 60 number that everyone's toying with. So I think, I think it's, it's partly the therapy, but it's also how do you get them through that first seven to 10 days, right? So what okay. I do, is I ice and elevate uh, and I control their pain. Additionally, the only additional thing that I do compared to those other multimodal people is I use an adductor canal block with a long acting you know, uh, uh, treatment, which is using the catheter. Uh, and so we see about 94% success rate with that. Admittedly, there's about a 6%, you know, leakage or I see some blood, Dr. Wickline, I pulled it out when I went to the bathroom, Dr. Wickline. Uh, but 94% of patients, uh, that, that helps them get over that 36 hour window. So you yep. use the you use the, the, the pain ball, the Ampi pain ball in an adductor block. I do, that's correct. And who puts in the adductor block? You or through the intraarticular or or the anesthesiologist? So I'm lucky. Uh, I tortured my anesthesia department a while ago and uh, I said you do this or else I'm leaving. Uh, I need, you know, I need three rooms, I need to, uh, I need buy-in to be part of the program and be on my team or else you know you guys can can try to find someone else to 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 fill your rooms and so they finally you know we, we got together now we're great friends it works out great now so they do it for me i know a lot of surgeons have trouble uh with their anesthesia team and it's really unfortunate we should be all working together for the same goal but i there's two different ways you can do it either you can do it yourself I know a lot of surgeons do it that way because of the lack of anesthesia support or in my group, I'm lucky that, you know, they do it both at my surgery center and the, the hospital. Uh, and, you know, once you have a successful program, you know, they like being part of it. They like knowing that they're part of the solution, but it's hard to, to you know, get over that first hump. How many days is that pump in there? So it depends. I use the variable pump. Um, it's a little more pricey, but I think patients like having patients, you know, remember the days of the PCA patients like knowing they could control the pain if they needed to, right? right. They like having some autonomy. And so the pump allows them to uh, increase or decrease. And I will tell you, you hit that 36 hour window and you can probably tell us from your own experience that 36 hour window is, is pretty tough. You and I know that it's going to be over by 48 hours so we can grit our teeth and get through it. And even though I show them a video and tell them that, 
they still have, to, you know, it's their first time and they've never done total yep. joints before. So they like the fact that they can turn it up for a couple hours and turn it back down. So you can get about three days uh, up to five days with it. Yeah, I, uh, I always would say to my patients that the pain is like a barking dog behind the door. You don't know what kind of dog it is. So every bark sounds kind of scary. Right. But since I was an orthopedic surgeon, I knew on day on 48 hours what, what to expect at 36 and, and further in 72. I actually had to do that math for a second. And, uh, you know, so it, it was a little easier. But when it's your first time and you haven't gone with anybody, it, it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. What, what it would be your advice to uh, other surgeons, other programs, um, what they, how they should go about it step by step? Yeah. So every quarter I go and operate with someone new. I recommend that to every single surgeon on the call. That's how we learn as surgeons, as residents. We don't learn by going to meetings. And that's really the only reason that I'm successful, to be honest. I, I am not smarter than anyone else. I don't have any better hands than anyone else. I just go and learn and take the, the one little trick that each surgeon teaches me uh, from each of these sites. And so I would, but I would do that with an anesthesiologist. My anesthesia team, if you, you're welcome to come visit me, my anesthesia team would love to have, you know, to, to talk about all the different things that they've done and tried. Uh, and, and I would love to work with the orthopedic surgeon. Come visit. It's, you know, it is the best thing that I've done for my practice is uh, go and operate. I was just out at the Connecticut Joint Replacement Institute and uh, with Laura Wynn and uh, um, the group there. It was, we really had a great time. Um, my anesthesia team went with me and uh, again, it was a great exchange of ideas. So that's what I would recommend. I think that's great advice to, to, to benchmark. I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping for a second. Um, everyone who's on the call will be getting an email um, on how to get CME credit, uh, if that's important to you. If it's not, then just uh, ignore that, ignore that email. Uh, that, have, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, Kevin, how about anybody using uh, devices like Romtech for home PT? I've been using that for about the last year and patients absolutely love it because they can start pedaling from day one, even when the range of motion is very low because of the adjustable pedal length. They don't have to do heavy resistance, but it gets things moving, pumps the blood. And, you know, I found it very useful. Is anybody else using that or any other devices for uh, home PT, basically? Because they can do it every day. What's the name of that exactly again? Uh, Romtech, R-O-M-T-E-C-H. It's, it's uh, like a bicycle pedaler? Yeah, it's basically a little recumbent unit that uh, Wi-Fi connects. You can monitor what the patient's doing. It has a little goniometer that uh, clamps to the leg, so it actually measures range of motion real time. It's all uploaded. You can track them um online um you can see how long they're doing it they can do it several times a day but having it at home rather than having to go to therapy two or three times a week they can do it daily um and it, it it's very motivating because there's a screen built in that can actually well you just lost you kevin yeah sorry um they were just am i back on yeah you're on. sorry um yeah, the, the, there's a built-in screen, like a little tablet, so they can interface directly with the physical therapist. They can monitor. They put in their pain scores. So you can monitor remotely doing physical therapy. It's been great uh, during COVID, especially, uh, since they don't have to come into therapy. But uh, patients just love it. So, I mean, I do it for ACLs and things, too. But um, if that's uh, you know something that could be of benefit in lieu of physical therapy, uh, you may want to take a look at that. Um, just go on their website. But they now have Lots of distribution centers around the country. So it's, it's catching on. It's active CPM. So it's not oh. passive. It's CAM, I guess. Continuous yeah. active motion. So I would say that, um, you know, uh, uh, Kirk, I've operated with Kirk, Kirk Kingsvater uh, out in uh, Colorado. He's crazy. 1,400 joints a year. Uh, a really bright guy, dedicated guy. Uh, also races cars with me. So I like him a lot. Uh, he... Uh, he makes his he, same thing. He makes his patients buy a, an exercise bike. So he must be in some <laughs> town in Colorado because my patients could not all afford an exercise bike. But he agrees, you know, that it's, it's trying to get that motion. And so I have my patients once an hour do uh, they sit, sit in a chair, they bring your leg back as far as they can, lock their foot on the floor and then scooch their butt forward, which creates a passive 
uh, uh, flexion, right? Uh, and then they do a, uh, a knee straightening uh, exercise as well. Um, you know, again, put your foot up on a little stool and push flat and use your hands to push flat. And again, what you're trying to do is you're not trying to strengthen the muscle. You're trying to get that range of motion. Remember, fluid doesn't compress. So once the knee gets big and swollen, you know, you're going to get 90, 95 degrees. And you have to, to keep that, that, that blood that's in there that's, that's getting infiltrated by fibroblasts that create scar. You have to keep that moving in the areas where it needs to be moving to prevent that scar formation. That's my belief. You know, I, I haven't proven that with, a, with an actual model. But, but, you know, I think we all believe we could knock a patient out for six weeks in an ICU and we can go in and move that knee back and forth, you know, for five, two minutes, even once an hour that that patient would wake up in six weeks and say, Oh, I love my new knee. This is amazing because they didn't go pound around on it and walk five miles. Like most of my 57 year old men like to do, because that's easier than, than bending and straining that hurts because yeah. again, you're pushing against swollen tissue. So I agree well, with you. Bike is a good, a good plan. The key is how do you get over that, that, you know, you need to get to that one ten point, but I, I'd like to see 110 by two weeks. Well, the, the difference, the only difference with Romtech is that it has a variable pedal length. So you can start with 10 degrees of flexion and just kind of do this. And as the pedal gets further away from the axle, the circumference, the radius, uh, sorry, the circumference, the radius increases. The circumference gets bigger. The range of motion gets bigger. Because my biggest gripe was I couldn't get a patient around a bike. You're right. So they get to 105, 110 degrees. Here they can start day one and get moving because... They have a very short stroke length until they're ready to make it bigger and bigger and bigger until they're up to 110, 120, et cetera. The other thing is it's covered by Medicare for three weeks and most insurances cover it. So they don't have to buy a bike. It's a rental. Right. So that's just well, something Kevin, to kind of throw into the, into the mix. Yeah, Kevin, I would uh, challenge you to write a brief communication for the journal <laughs> on your experience. About my experience? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been using it for about a year now. And yeah, we'd it, love to uh, see it. I mean, it's sure. the kind of stuff it's, people want to know. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been great. People, people like it. This is the stuff that this journal really is meant for. You know, you go to AUKUS and again, anything you publish, you know, or, or research, you know, you know, it took me years to get my, you know, this is from 2018 data. I mean, it took me years to get this published. Thankfully, IRA has a, a, a forum to publish it. You know, I had 386 consecutive patients, every single one covered through New York State uh, iStop database. That should be published, whether or not, you know, JOA likes the fact that I'm not at an academic center, yeah. you know, thankfully Iris got that. So this is the stuff that, that we can move patients forward outside of the academic world. You know, you and I are, are patient, are, are patient centered uh, surgeons, right? You know, we're not, we're not sitting here doing 150 cases a year. You know, we're doing 800 cases a year and patients need real answers. Well, I'm going to be away next week. So it's a good time to write that article. So. I can't I'll work on it. it. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be great. Um, um, any other comments? Otherwise, I want to pass it over to Samantha again. She wants to show, and I promised her as a sponsor, she gets a couple of minutes towards the end uh, to, to show something. Samantha, you want to do something? or? Yeah, definitely. I'll do, I'll do the next video here. So, Hello everyone. So just again, um, I'll give a brief introduction of it, but we have just a quick video um, that we'd like to play for you all. So just for a little bit of background and, and um, Dr. Wickline was talking about it um, a little bit, but you can place the on cue pump um, via the anesthesia team with an ultrasound guided adductor canal block. And that's what um, Dr. Wickline was speaking to, um, but it can also be placed surgically via a silver coated catheter. So this video um, is from our one of our other surgeons, Dr. Rashala, he's an orthopedic surgeon out of the University at Buffalo here in New York. So he's going to talk to how he places the catheter and pump through the incision for his TK procedures. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'll make sure to share computer sound here. So let me know. Hear it okay? Yeah. Perfect. A couple of years ago, we started developing this new technique with, in conjunction with um, scientists at Avanas um, called Sur Surgeon Place Continuous Periarticular Nerve Blockage. It's Surgeon Place, it's placed by me in the OR. It is not just aiming for one nerve, it's aiming for the nerves all around the joint. Um, and it has a catheter and an on-cue pain relief system that lets me 
have the local anesthesia going continuously over the first three to five days after surgery. There are no procedural delays as I do it myself. It provides very effective release the first, relief the first few days. It reduces the risk of rebound pain, and that's been shown in other papers too in other subspecialties. Patient controls the flow rate, so they have something to do, titrate the pain, titrate the medication um, as their pain increases. So it gives them the comfort that they're in charge of their pain control. This is a cadaver, so we mark supramedial aspect of the knee. This is a femur. We make a small incision there using medicine bomb scissors. And that's the direction of us placing the catheter. And this pituitary that I used to introduce the catheter is about six inches long. It turns out that if you can put that over there based on our cadaver studies, it seems like that's an ideal spot for getting periodic blockage. And, and once we open it, there's actually a plane there. You can just basically put your finger up with a blunt dissection so that you're not causing any damage and put the pituitary in and you can, that's basically the move that you use to place the catheter. Again, the catheter is coming from outside in and you take the pituitary and put it underneath the vastus medialis over the medial intermuscular septum. Now, when I do this dissection, when I put my finger in to bluntly dissect this area and feel the medial intermuscular septum. I actually intentionally apply pressure posteriorly using my finger because that fascia is actually fenestrated. I actually like to disrupt that fascia so that some of my local anesthetic also goes into the posterior compartment, thereby anesthetizing the posterior obturator nerve and also the tibial posterior articular nerve branch of the tibial nerve. All right. Well, thanks. So I, uh, there was a couple of, thank you, Samantha. There was a couple of questions about where to find Dr. Wickline's articles. Um, I will share my screen again, possibly, uh, maybe not yet. Uh, I'll share it here um, and go to the journal. So if you go to the journal, here it is. And on the side, there's a little search button. And you just search the word Wickline. All right. And you'll find the article here. Just click on the article. It will come up. All right. And this is his 23-hour total knee opioid in 10 opioid pills or less. All right. And you can read the article here online. Um, and there's a lot of information about coaches, education class. Another good feature that we have is you could actually save this article as a PDF and it would actually load up um, and you'd be able to see this as a PDF article um, that, that you could actually share um, with, with, uh, with somebody. So you can save the article as, as, as a PDF, uh, which, which is fine. But all you have to do is search for that article. You'll find it. All the other articles are here. And um, we just published this new article on trends in total shoulder. Um, so I'll stop with that. And we'll go back to the case at hand. Uh, I know we're sort of nearing the end here. Uh, again, everyone will be getting uh, an um, um, email about the how to get CME from Adapt Track, which will be very good. Um, Andrew, any final comments on, uh, or anyone else uh, we could, uh, you could talk out of turn, anyone want to? Yeah, Derek, what do you got? Uh, it, thank you, Andrew, for sharing all your experiences here. Just curious, like, what are your thoughts where you want to innovate next? So, uh, uh, as D Derek and I have uh, discussed, in the past, I'm really looking to, you know, I think the industry, the, we're at a, a kind of a crossroads here. You know, I'm 40% down for reimbursement. Every single one of my, my staff members need, need a raise to keep up with the cost of living. And, I, you know, I don't want to do more than 800 joints a year. And so I'm looking to innovate uh, in, the, in the, the reimbursement you know, uh, phase, number one. Number two, uh, I'm looking at the post-discharge swelling. 
Uh, I have a number of uh, thoughts on how to uh, identify the swelling curve. And again, Brian Lloyd's got this great paper where he used body impedance looking at uh, the normal, the, like uh, created an actual uh, uh, you know, mean and standard deviations of what, what the amount of swelling is in terms of body impedance. But it's not super helpful in terms of where the swelling is and what, what can be done to reduce that swelling. I think swelling is the prime reason that patients have pain. Um, we, of course, know that increased swelling leads to decreased uh, ambulation. There's this other, uh, I forget the word, it's called AMI, but basically it's a, it's a, it's a word that, a phrase that I've never heard in orthopedics, but it basically means that you have a lot of swelling, it impedes muscle activation. We're not even talking about it in orthopedics, yet the therapists are all talking about it. The two, the two fields need to come together. So my goal in the next two uh, years is to identify what the uh, normal uh, volumetric swelling is in the lower leg, uh, and then uh, find uh, the actual bona fide ways that reduce the swelling, because I think that's going to get patients back to work faster. You know, unfortunately, there's no money in that uh, uh, that space, but there is in patient satisfaction, and, and and again, that may mean less phone calls for me and less heartache for me. So that's that's really what I'm looking to do in the next 18 months. Andrew, this is uh, Jack Perry, an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I'm interested because you mentioned multimodal pain management. I was on my hospital's committee to bring that in. And now we're seeing articles from anesthesiology that says gabapentinoids are potentially damaging for us. And yet we've all drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, muscle relaxants uh, cause urinary retention. And so the multimodals aren't, um, aren't a panacea uh, that I've found. Uh, they're certainly helpful, but do you agree with maybe some of the literature now coming out that gabapentinoids are, are not helpful, like Lyrica and gabapentin? And, and uh, uh, so is that, what is your personal feeling on some of those adjunctive medications? So my typical patient gets baby aspirin twice a day for 30 days. They get Celebrex uh, twice a day if they're not allergic or meloxicam. Again, if their kidneys, you know, again, making sure they don't have a GI ulcer, you know, don't have Crohn's disease and so forth. Uh, they get prednisone five milligrams unless they're insulin dependent diabetic uh, or poorly controlled orally, you know, uh, diabetic oral medication. Uh, and uh, what am I missing there? And Tylenol. So that's hips and knees. That's, you know, that's, that's the basic cocktail uh, with an intraarticular injection for hips and knees uh, with some rapipocaine, clonidine, and Toradol. Um, I don't use a tourniquet for the knees. Again, I don't use any therapy for either group. So again, they're not being tortured for 90 minute session three times a week. Um, and uh, I do use gabapentinoids. Uh, I would say that the, uh, I don't know where the authors are looking at this data. Um, I can tell you that I, I have, again, I, I live in a small town and patients don't call for refills unless they think it's working. And uh, so the gabapentinoids seem to work for, for the majority of patients. My personal experience is my wife's cancer treatment surgery. She had five days, of, you know, her arm was on fire. Gabapentinoid, 80% better. You use uh, the tramadol, didn't help. Um, you know, so I think it works. And it, it's, you know, is there some potential risk there? Yes, there probably, you know, there is. You have to look at kidney dysfunction and, and, and dial back the, the amounts so instead of 300, maybe 100, and use it as needed. And I have a video that tells patients, here are the four pills you're going to take. Here are the two breakthrough medicines, and I call it breakthrough. And I tell the patients, you're gonna have breakthrough pain at 36 hours, at five, three to five days when the pain ball wears off, and between seven and 10 days, which corresponds to that, that paper I've been quoting uh, that I just recently found that, that shows that that's when the maximum swelling is. That's when that patient calls you on day eight and says, oh my God, my calf, it really hurts. What happened, what happened? I think I got a clot. You come in, they can barely walk, and they were doing fine for three to four days. That's because all the bleeding from the knee travels down that calf. It's sitting in the, behind the calf and between the calf and the soleus, the gastric and soleus, and they're in pain. Blood irritates, blood is a potent irritant of the muscle. And so again, it's, it's understanding what's happening, explaining to the patient before it happens, then they don't freak out. And getting, that, getting ahead of the anxiety curve is really the answer to multimodal. Yeah. You know, Okay. Oh, sorry, Dad, somebody else. Okay, I was going to answer. Derek, I think one of the big innovations that I'm looking for from what Andrew's worked on is scaling it. Scaling it to places like the South Bronx, like Cook County, like L.A. County Hospital, like 
these kinds of places, I think this is a scalable program. I don't think you need um, a grand piano in your uh, lobby. I don't think you need chauffeurs to bring people up to the floor. Uh, I don't think you need um, HBO for your TV. I think this is a scalable program for everywhere. Uh, someone asked, uh, uh, one of the people asked in the chat, can we see an example of the patient education book? And I found one online and I'll just show it um, um, here. Um, I would, uh, while you're looking at it, I will tell you that it's absolutely uh, uh, scalable. You know, the patients who did the best are not my local patients who had, you know, this is how I also figured out no therapy works. The patients who went to inpatient rehab and had the you know, most money in my town, that's those ones who went to rehab, uh, they had double the manipulation rate and double the narcotic usage. And, and again, I don't have a study to prove that, but that was what I, I identified. And then the patients who lived up north in the Adirondacks who had no access to physical therapy said, doc, just show me the simple four exercise, what I got to do, and I'll make, it, I'll make it happen. And, you know, tell me what to expect. Those patients, they all got better. And, you know, these are the, those are the patients who didn't have all the cash. And I'm telling you that this, this works. And I, I, you know, I went to India and, and talked about this in India and everyone thought I was a little crazy. And then COVID hit. And, you know, thankfully the surgeon who sponsored me to come over and talk about this, you know, said, Andrew, this is, this has really been a big, you know, uh, boon for us because, you know, we knew about this, that there was the potential. Uh, I can tell you that my practice did not suffer. I was 20 cases down despite, you know, the hospital being shut down for you know, four months, you know, 20 cases. So when patients know that they can go straight home and they don't have to be exposed to coronavirus because they can do exercise at home, it makes a big difference. And I will, just to make it clear to everyone, 85% of my knees use no therapy. 15% do need a therapy for the knees. There's, they either don't understand or I'm not getting act, I'm not getting through to them, or perhaps that's where maybe some sort of digital thing like Jack Perry mentioned might make a difference. But the question is, is, you know, do you need to spend that, you know, 200, 800 thousand dollars you know, at what point are you saving money and or should you just go see a therapist again? Interesting. Uh, there was also a question about any concerns about infection with the, uh, with the pump. So I don't use the pump intra-articularly. Uh, I use it extra-articularly. I don't have, uh, uh, so I don't have any knowledge to, uh, to, to reach back out to that, uh, uh person about the intra-articular placement. I can tell you that I've had one patient since I've been using uh, an additric canal pump. So I don't know, 2015, somewhere in there. So six years, I've had one patient that I placed on antibiotics because of, uh, you know, some swelling and some redness around the, the catheter site. That's it. Oh, interesting. That's, I don't know, 550 total knees a year for six years. Wow, good deal. Um, does anyone have any, uh, any, uh, final questions, uh, for Andrew? Um, um, Andrew, I want to thank you so much for the amazing articles in the journal. I think you, um, um, showed what, uh, experience and innovation brings to the table. I really mean that uh, sincerely. Um, and I'm glad that, that we were able to give a voice to a uh, tremendous amount of work being done um, you know, in, in the other part of New York. Well, I would, uh, I would hope that anyone that didn't, you know, it's, it's a very large journal club this time around. So unlike the first time where I think people maybe felt more confident to speak up, uh, I've left my personal email there. I can tell you that after I gave this talk in August, uh, I have answered uh, about 800 emails uh, since that time. Uh, I do get back to you. It might take a little while. Uh, like I said, my wife's sick right now, so it may take a, you know, a couple of days, but I will get back to you and I'll do my best to answer your questions. This is important to me. And I can tell you, this is, my PAs love my new practice. And, and uh, my, pay, my, my staff, my, my medical assistants love the, the way the practice is because we're not getting phone calls about opioids all the time. We're not getting phone calls, patients crying and screaming in pain anymore. Mm -hmm. So I really, would to, to, I really would like the audience to reach out to me if you have questions specific that maybe you're afraid to ask or it's too, too uh, cumbersome to ask on this um, platform. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm definitely not the, the only expert on this in the world. 
uh, but I'm at least give you my advice. All right. Any other final comments? And other than that, Samantha, any final things? Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, sponsoring us for the journal. Yeah, no, no final comments. Just want to say thank you all and thanks for the engagement and participation. All right. All right. So um, unless anyone has anything else, I'll count down to five, four, three, two, one, and we'll sign off. Is that it? Thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate it. Reach out yeah. to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.